This year, Vauxhall celebrates their 165th birthday. So today, join us as we are going to explore the history of this fantastic company from start till, well, now. My name is David from Eden Motor Group, and today we are learning the entire history of Vauxhall. Carrying on from its initial birth just six years later, Vauxhall was purchased by Andrew Brown, who transformed the company into a crane manufacturer, perfect for the Industrial Revolution. These cranes were manufactured all the way up until 1903, when they started producing luxury cars. In 1903, the company built its first car with the bizarre 719, a five-horsepower single-cylinder model steered using a tiller, and for those who don't know, a tiller is essentially the same kind of lever used to steer a boat. With two forward gears and no reverse gear, this car was truly an odd sight to behold by modern standards. About 70 were made in the first year, before the car was improved with a steering wheel and reverse gear in 1904, which I can imagine would have made things a lot easier, especially when trying to maneuver yourself around horses. Perhaps Vauxhall's first car that was more traditionally designed was by a pioneer, Lawrence Pomeroy. And with a name like that, you knew that the chap was going to be keen on his engineering. This is where the beautiful A09 Vauxhall Type A was spawned. Production started in 1908 and halted in 1914, with the last A-Type rolling off the factory floor in 1920. With almost no roads in the UK, the final car with its 3-litre engine could reach up to 100 miles an hour. An amazing feat considering the car only had around 20 brake horsepower. And even even more amazing when you consider the driver had no seatbelts, ABS, traction control, crumple zones, and tires not much wider than the mountain bikes. By 1919, however, Pomeroy had had enough. He went to work for the Aluminium Company of America on producing engine blocks, pistons, and other parts which would eventually be used by Pierce Arrow of America. Meanwhile, in the UK, by 1920, the war had took its toll on the economy. Demand for high-end luxury cars was at an all-time low. 1925 brought a future juggernaut of the car industry to Vauxhall, General Motors. GM acquired Vauxhall for a fairly modest sum of $2.5 million, and in today's money that would be close to $41 million. But much like the myth of the frog that's placed into boiling water, GM realized they could not simply go from creating luxury cars and regress into the everyman's car that GM wanted them to be. GM knew that an everyman's car meant more sales. So slowly, over the next five years, GM started to target the middleman. This truly came to fruition when they released the Vauxhall Cadet, a lowly two-litre, priced below £300. And this is the first time that we ever see Vauxhall's VX badge, as that's exactly what the engine supplied was called. Supplied for export would have 27 horsepower. However, most would see a 17 brake horsepower engine and a first for the UK, a totally synchro mesh gearbox, movable seats, wind down windows, and a lockable cupboard under the bonnet. As the years went on, Vauxhall found more and more success in the general market thanks to GM's overhead involvement, selling over 26,000 versions of their Light 6 in just one year, and at less than 200 pounds, it's no surprise as to why. In just one year, Vauxhall had become a serious juggernaut in the UK, and improving the Light 6 over time meant they always stayed ahead of the game. Vauxhall had found that they had come up with a winning formula. By making smaller cars with the latest engineering and modern touches, they were able to offer more but for less to the general public. So far, we have not mentioned the Luton factory, which had played a significant role in the creation of most of the lineup, and in 1934, they expanded the workforce, doubling down on the success of the Light 6. However, tragedy was just around the corner. That at any time, violent and dire events will open. If so, we shall confront them with fortitude. If not, we shall profit to the full by the time at our disposal. The Second World War had reared its ugly head, and the Luton factory halted most of its production in lieu of the war effort. 
Vauxhall actually produced a tank for Churchill's war, aptly named Churchill and designed for infantry. Over 5,500 were produced, with around 300 being sent to the Eastern Front to aid the Soviets. In a quote from Churchill after seeing the initial disappointment with the early revisions, he is said to say to Jan Smuts that the tank was named after me when they found out it was no damn good. One can only assume he was joking, however, as the tank became more versatile as the war effort continued. The tanks actually stopped production in 1942, with the improvements being made to already built tanks. And by the end of the war, the Churchill tank had seen action in Italy, Africa, India, Burma, and of course, France and Germany. In 1940, a tragedy stopped production briefly as a German bombing raid killed 39 employees of the Luton factory. And while the tanks were possibly the most interesting thing to come out of the factory during the war, 250,000 lorries were also produced. But luckily, the war didn't last forever. 1945 brought an end to the war and peacetime for Europe. With many companies going into administration or being broken apart, Vauxhall found success in converting the Bedford trucks they had made during the war to civilian use, ensuring a steady flow of income. During this time after the war, Vauxhall made the E-Type. Uh, no, not that E-Type, this E-Type. A small and easily produced personal car for day-to-day -day use. Thanks to tax and horsepower changes that favored a smaller engine car, this little 1.5 four-cylinder found success, making over 110,000 E-Types per year and refining the car year on year. From the E-Type came the P-Type and F-Type. What else is there among the Victor's highlights? Let's have a look at some of them on this deluxe model, the Victor Super. However, they didn't quite have the same success as the E-Type. However, Vauxhall was still able to produce over 180,000 models in its lifetime. However, this is where Vauxhall made its first critical mistake. Considering the manufacturer was coming up to its 100th year birthday, this actually wasn't too bad in terms of an overall record breaker. However, the mistake was a biggie. The F-Type and P-Type developed a reputation for rapid, severe structural corrosion. The F-Type Victor was particularly affected by this issue. It was caused by numerous moisture traps in its body design, and unfortunately, it would affect the whole car. However, Vauxhall rided their way through the storm and came out the other side with what I would deem as the first true Vauxhall Halo car. All new Viva by Vauxhall. The Viva was introduced a year after Vauxhall's fellow GM company Opel launched the Opel Cadet, which you may have seen before from a certain TV show. Float! Float! Oliver! This was the HA. Announced in September 1963 and replaced with the HB in September 1966, Vauxhall's first serious step into the compact car market had begun. The HA Viva was powered by a tiny 1057cc engine to drive the rear wheels and went through a few iterations, including the HB and, of course, the HC. Hello, I'm James Hunt. And I'd like to show you a really great car, this Vauxhall Viva. Vauxhall was smashing out five-figure sales over its whole model range by the end of the 60s, and in 1970, the HC Viva was launched, which went on to become Vauxhall's best-selling car of the decade. In 1975, Vauxhall launched a small car, the Chevette, and a little car you may have heard of to compete with the mighty Ford Cortina. This was called the Cavalier. Vauxhall Cavalier at your Vauxhall dealer now. The Cavalier was launched with a 1.9-litre engine. Just after its launch, the Cavalier was tested by Watcar magazine and smashed the rating of the Cortina and the Marina. This meant that orders went through the roof and demand was outstripping supply by a huge margin. The first Vauxhall Cavalier to be assembled at Vauxhall's Luton plant was actually driven off the production line by Eric Fountain, Vauxhall's manufacturing director, on the 26th of August, 1977. The Chevette and Cavalier went through multiple upgrades throughout the years, and in 1978, with Vauxhall wanting to compete in the executive car market, launched the Carlton, 
This car would birth one of the coolest cars ever made, the insane 3.6-litre twin-turbo Lotus Carlton collaboration and the fastest four-seater car in the world in 1990. With over 377 horsepower, this machine not only showed that Vauxhalls could produce a performance car, but could do it while creating an icon in the process. While I could make a video solely on the Lotus Carlton, and don't forget to comment and hit like and subscribe and ring that bell, because if enough people do that, then why not make a video on it? We must push on and talk about the remaining cars from the 80s, as that's where the next staple of Vauxhall rolled off the shelf with the Astra. Low drag contributes to urban fuel economy of 28.8 miles per gallon and at 56 miles per hour, 47.1 miles per gallon. Replacing the Viva, the Astra became hugely popular with buyers. In 1982, the Cavalier gained a Mark II and was the first small car in the UK to offer front-wheel drive, and 83 saw the introduction of the precursor to the Corsa, the Nova, which spelled the doom of the Chevette, which was discontinued just a year later. 84 saw the revision of the Astra, while the Carlton won Car of the Year in 87, and shortly after appeared, as mentioned before, the infamous Lotus Car. 1991 was a busy year, full of amazing feats. Mount Hecla erupts, Downing Street suffered a mortar strike, one of the greatest films ever to grace our screens, The Silence of the Lambs came out, Arsenal won the Football League, Queen Elizabeth became the first British monarch to aggress Congress, the first British person left the atmosphere all the way to space, and a spectator at the US Open was struck by lightning, Nirvana released Nevermind, and Freddie Mercury unfortunately passed on, and your favourite Eden presenter was born. However, in the world of Vauxhall, the third generation Astra was birthed. Vauxhall also partnered with Isuzu to make the Frontera. Skipping ahead to 95, the Cavalier finally met its demise after 20 full years of service and was replaced with the Mark I Vectra. And in 98, the fourth gen Astra was unveiled, a unifying Vauxhall's new look. Vauxhall wanted to further their reputation, and by Y2K, the launch of one of the cars that actually got me interested in motor vehicles in the first place came out. The Vauxhall VX220 was ready for the world to see. <laughs> Built in the Lotus plant in Norfolk, the VX220 was developed on the Lotus Mark II Elise platform, had a radical aluminium frame that weighed less than 80 kilos, and the whole body was made of fiberglass. A 145 horsepower 2.2 engine and only 875 kilos would make the car actually outperform its Lotus brethren, and in 2004, launched the daddy, the VXR220. With lowered suspension, a tweaked turbo, and a big brake kit, the car produced 220 horsepower with one color and one color only available, Calypso Red. With 0-60 time in 4.7 seconds, this car was truly awesome, especially from Vauxhall, who, with the exception of the Carlton, had not produced anything like this before. Ending production in 2005, seeing one of these on the road today is a very, very rare sight. But we should probably have a look at some of the rest of Vauxhall's lineup. In 93, the Vauxhall Nova was axed for the Corsa, which would become the most sold car in the world later down the line, and the Carlton was replaced with the Omega. Aside from the VX220, Vauxhall brought revisions to the Corsa, badged a larger Vectra as the Signum, and launched the Safira, a massively popular MPV. The Omega ended production in 2003, and the fantastic Astra Mark V came into play. With the C-segment going up and the hatchback market booming, the Mark V Astra was a striking-looking car, and was responsible for Jeremy Clarkson having to eat his own hair as well. Um, but basically, it's Vauxhall that are responsible for Jeremy having to eat his own hair. And, uh, there it is. Ta-da! Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh! It looks worse than I expected. You Come saw on, this fella. is my hair. Oh, most of it, yeah. Oh, hang on. I, no, it is all yours. 
The car marked a change in Vauxhall's styling, which started with the Mark II Vectra in 2002 and would be seen across the whole range of cars, with the Vectra being axed in 2008 and replaced by the unbelievably gorgeous Insignia. And speaking of 2008, it seems that Vauxhall's creative team decided to flex their muscles a little bit because along came the Monaro. The precursor to the VXR8, the Monaro was actually a rebadged Holden and had a 6-litre V8, which made it absolutely bonkers. The replacement, however, was more bonkers still. This took the Holden HSV R8 and rebadged it, sold it as what can only be described as a pure monster, all the way up until 2017, where Holden unfortunately filed for bankruptcy, which meant the VX R8 had to go as well. But not before giving us this final hurrah. Nearly 600 horsepower through a manual gearbox, the latest and last VX R8 was truly an insane muscle car with huge brakes and a £55,000 price tag to boot. It had just 65 horsepower less than a Ferrari 488 GTB, and the torque could probably tow Australia itself. But going back a little bit more, 2008 also saw the creation of us, Eden Motor Group. CEO Graham Potts, our founder, established the brand in 2008 and has pushed it as a family-run business ever since, starting off by acquiring Exeter, Honiton, Reading, Newbury and Fairham, a very welcome addition to the Vauxhall family, and have since acquired new dealers throughout the south of the UK. Eden have been proud to represent Vauxhall ever since. A new decade saw revisions to most of Vauxhall's lineup, and in 2012 launched the Vauxhall Adam as a response to Fiat's Fiat 500, debuting at the Paris Motor Show in late 2012, and with a Mocha debuting the same year at the Geneva Motor Show. Vauxhall's lineup was looking strong very early into the 2010s. Vauxhall continued to update the lineup through the years. However, in 2017, PSA acquired Vauxhall and Opel. Stellantis would then take over, in addition to adding Fiat Chrysler in 2021. And this led to some of the most incredible redesigns of cars I've ever seen. Because as of 2022, Vauxhall's car lineup looks like this. The Corsa, Mocha, all-new Astra, Crossland, Grandland, and Insignia are all fabulously designed cars and well-rounded in today's current climate. With a Luton plant and Ellesmere port active, Vauxhall still have a home in UK manufacturing. Now, you may notice I haven't talked about Vauxhall's EV range, and that's because I think it deserves its own section. In 2012, the European Car of the Year was launched, the Vauxhall Ampera, and this year, just gone February, it celebrated its 10th birthday. While the car was only on sale for three years, it paved the way for the Corsa EV, Mocha EV, Grandland Hybrid and all-new Astra Hybrids as well. With the Corsa E coming out in April 2020, we got a fun-to-drive EV at a great price. I've already covered the Corsa E and Mocha E. If you click up in the top right-hand corner of the screen, you'll be able to see those for yourself. Future plans say that Vauxhall are looking to be all electric by 2028, and if this car ever sees the light of day, you'd be hard pushed keeping me away. This is the Manta E concept, and never have I ever wanted something to go into production more than this beast. But if you're thinking that too, Apparently, it's slated to arrive by 2025, and with a fully electric Astra to supposedly arrive in 2023, it's going to be an interesting few years when it comes to EVs in Vauxhall's lineup. Thank you very much for watching. There are things that I simply didn't have time to cover, such as Vauxhall's vans, including their new EV vans, concept cars like the Astra VXR Extreme, the VX Lightning, Scamp and GT, or even Vauxhall's racing pedigree, notably of course, the BTCC. And don't forget, if you want me to cover more like this in the future, you're going to need to let me know in the comment section. Let me know of anything I got wrong. Let me know of what I did right, and I'll be there to reply. 
And if you enjoy the video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. It's useful, helps us out, and ensures that I know that to make more videos like this in the future. Vauxhall have been around for well over 100 years. And before writing the script for this video, I had no idea they had such an extensive and interesting history. A huge thank you has to go out to Voxopedia. You can check out the YouTube channel as a link in the video description where they have loads of archival footage to check out and see. Everything in this video has been made with the informative, transformative content in mind. Thank you ever so much for watching.